to another episode of the Left of Lansing podcast with Pat Johnston. A progressive insight into Michigan's political and cultural world. And of course, an entertaining podcast designed to shine a light on how to make Michigan's political machine work for the people. Now, from the left of Lansing headquarters, located in his attic, here's the award-winning Pat Johnston. Oh, yeah. Welcome to another edition of Michigan's premier progressive podcast. And as Jessica just announced, I am Pat Johnston. And I finally, finally understand what people meant when they talked about getting to see the Northern Lights. I mean, that was such a stunning show on Friday night. And the clouds at our house here in Gratia County cleared out just in time. And we got to see some gorgeous shots that I'm going to develop and hang somewhere here throughout the house. But was it just me or did the photos capture the striking colors of the lights more than the naked eye or at least my eye? I mean, don't get me wrong. I could see everything, but I felt like the camera on my phone was picking up brighter colors and and then contrasted with the starry night sky. It was breathtaking. So I can now cross that off my bucket list. Thank you very much, Michigan. Speaking of lights or dimming lights, Livingston County Sheriff, oh, I'm sorry, Constitutional Sheriff Mike Murphy got back in the news this week. Now, I've talked about Sheriff Murphy on the show before. You'll remember how Sheriff Murphy steadfastly refused to enforce any of the new gun safety laws that the Michigan Democratic majority in Lansing passed and then Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer signed into law. He especially said he wouldn't recognize the Extreme Risk Protection Order, otherwise known as Red Flag Laws, because he views that law as unconstitutional. And he made that grand announcement on Facebook last year. In the same post, Sheriff Murphy said, such laws were just trying to fix society's ills with legislation that's never worked. Now, as our good friend of the podcast, Livingston County progressive fighter Casey Helton tweeted, laws are pointless, so why even have them? Is a hell of a take for a sheriff, I'll say that. So I guess having a sheriff to enforce those pointless laws is now also pointless too? I mean, Miss Helton nailed it on the head. I mean, what was the point of having someone assigned with the duty to enforce laws if they refused to enforce said laws? Seems like a waste of money to me. Regardless, Murphy said his constituents still did not want red flag laws. And besides, they're unconstitutional. I mean, this made all kinds of news last year, which was on top of the right wing Livingston County Board of Commissioners adopting a resolution last year declaring itself a constitutional county, which basically means ignoring laws they don't like. Again, this is from the law and order crowd, mind you. Oh, and last winter, the Livingston County Board of Commissioners and Sheriff Murphy received 10th Amendment awards from the Grand Wizard Party. Sorry, sorry, I misspoke there. From the Grand New Party Pack. Yes, they were standing up for states. And the 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution, of course, is where states have powers to pass laws they deem fit, where the federal government does not have such powers. Which, you know, I always found kind of strange here in this case because the gun safety laws were passed by the state government. (sighs) Anyway, Sheriff Murphy, I know, don't think, Pat, don't think, just go on. Anyway, Sheriff Murphy was lauded for his fealty to the gun rather than to the people. Now, red flag laws are designed to help prevent a gun death by allowing someone feeling maybe that their life is endangered or maybe someone is a danger to themselves. It allows somebody to petition a judge to possibly confiscate an individual's firearms if there is sufficient evidence, again, if there is sufficient evidence that the person is a danger to others or themselves. I mean, Michigan isn't the first state to have such a law in the books, and it's just another preventative tool for both citizens and law enforcement to utilize against a possible shooting death in the future. But Sheriff Murphy was resolute. He wasn't backing down to that tyrannical Democratic majority, and especially not to that woman, Gretchen Whitmer, until he did. Yeah, until he did back down and quietly enforced that law, a law Sheriff Mike claimed was unconstitutional. That's right. According to some great reporting by Bridge Magazine's Jordan Hermani, records show Murphy's office was one of the first in Livingston County 
to use an extreme risk protection order to confiscate weapons from a man undergoing what a deputy called a mental health crisis. The case was one of three red flag orders requested so far in the conservative county since the law took effect three months ago. The others were requested by the Michigan State Police over a suicide threat and a wife against her husband. Murphy, a Republican, told Bridge, Michigan last week that he's still not a fan of risk protection orders. However, if there's a tool that we can use in law enforcement to accomplish a goal, then why would we not use it? Huh. You're right. You're right, Sheriff Mike. Why not use it? As good friend of the podcast, University of Michigan gun injury prevention researcher Dr. April Zioli said in that Bridge Magazine story, we've seen in a lot of states certain sheriffs taking a stand and saying they're not going to enforce them, but they always do because it's the law. They recognize that some people are not safe to own guns at that moment. You know, for all the bluster, for all the bat crap, crazy right wing machoism, people like Sheriff Mike Murphy realize that helping save lives maybe isn't such a bad thing after all. But here's the money quote from Miss Hermani's story, and I quote While Murphy said that he's still not a fan of the red flag law, his concerns have somewhat eased because many of the initial requests were initiated by law enforcement or mental health professionals. They're people who Murphy defined as somebody with some credibility, which he said is a totally different situation than a scorned ex. Okay, so nothing like a little misogyny there at the end. But still, in other words, it's almost like Michigan Democrats passed a common sense gun safety law after all. Hey, Mike, I'll ask again, who's actually enacting common sense strategies to help people across Michigan, and who isn't? I'll tell you what, the right wing isn't there to help you. It cares about one thing, power. Case in point, Delta County in the Upper Peninsula. You'll recall Delta County made some huge news a couple of weeks ago when voters there successfully recalled the right-wing MAGA extremists from the County Board of Commissioners. That right-wing faction chose chaos over substance during its time, and it chose extremism over productivity. It fired the county administrator there because she accused those MAGA buffoons of being disrespectful to her. So they canned her for no reason. Then their male fragility took a little bit of a boo-boo. I mean, this MAGA majority held up funding for the 4-H program because of Michigan State University's DEI policies. I mean, how can anyone be taken seriously if they truly fear the scary DEI monster and its wicked ways of trying to ensure diversity and respect in the workplace? <gasps> so because of that, they wanted to make the 4-H kids suffer up there in Delta County. Now, yes, they eventually okayed the funding, but... There was no reason to even threaten to block it in the first place, unless you're insane. Which is why those three MAGA guys got trounced in their recall elections by two independent challengers and a Democratic challenger and good friend of the show, Kelly Van Genoven. It was a testament to the internal will and fortitude of not just those three challengers, but of the people of Delta County who simply wanted people in charge, who didn't think that their primary role was to always have the spotlight on themselves, but who thought their primary role was to serve the people and to help people. But it also showed everyone across the state that if right-wingers were getting shellacked in places like Delta County, then what could that portend in other races this fall, including the presidential race? I mean, the same night, Ottawa County ousted one of its Christian nationalist extremists in a recall election. I mean, can you imagine if, let's say, extreme right-wing Republicans won local recall elections in, say, southern Oakland County or Wayne County or Kent County. I mean, can you imagine what some of the Lansing intelligentsia would have been proclaiming? They'd be having roundtable discussions for hours over Democrats in disarray or, see, it's another case of Democrats going too far. I didn't see a whole lot of discussion about these recall elections. I guess it just goes against the narrative that people are tiring of Michigan Democrats. No, they're getting tired of MAGA Republicans. But despite the pulverization those three MAGA Delta County commissioners received, the three victors have yet to have taken their oaths of office. Why? Well, you see, there's no way the three MAGA commissioners lost. I mean, it, 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 it had to be voter fraud. And that's not me saying that, of course, but it's the two right-wing board of canvassers in Delta County who say that because they refuse to certify the election. An election, mind you, where the three right-winger MAGA commissioners not only lost, but they each lost by 40 percent. 40 percent. 
But these people are refusing to certify because, you see, their side lost and their side can never lose because corporate right wing media and their Facebook threads tell them they're in the majority. Now, there's one more meeting scheduled for May 20th, but if the board of canvassers once again refuses to certify the election, then it'll have to go to the state board of canvassers. So, you see, this is about two things. One, it's about delay, delay, delay. It's a favorite tactic of dear leader Trump's, of course, so they're just following suit. But you see, these new commissioners were only holding these seats for the rest of the year because, you know, you got the November elections coming up here in less than six months when they have to run again. So the longer it takes to get them in those seats, the better, according to the right-wingers. Secondly, the Christian nationalist right-wing movement doesn't believe in the will of the people. It doesn't believe in democracy. In fact, it despises democracy. That's why they always speak of the republic and refuse to say the word democracy, even though we're a democratic republic. Of course, this race had nothing to do with republicanism since it was winner take all for three commission seats. Winner take all, of course, is democracy. It's also why they're so afraid of Michigan joining the National Popular Vote Compact, where Michigan's electoral votes would automatically be awarded to whomever wins the majority of votes in a presidential election. They hate democracy because they believe they are on God's side, and they believe that God wants them running every facet of our government. It's why all those 15 MAGA Republicans tried to enforce their fake elector scheme after the 2020 defeat of their dear leader Trump. They tried to overrule the will of the people of the state. It's been a pattern, and it's a pattern that we're now seeing happening in Delta County. We'll keep an eye on this, but remember, this is a pattern, and it's going to happen again this fall. Somewhere in Michigan, it's going to happen this fall. It's about destroying democracy. That is what the right wing is about today, destroying the will of the people. But regardless, they can't deny the blowout losses they received, and it's becoming a pattern throughout Michigan, especially in these rural areas. And I'd like to continue my focus on rural Michiganders and how we progressives and Democrats alike can continue to make a dent in the right wing grip in many of these areas. That's why I've invited Mark Ludwig, chair of the Michigan Democratic Rural Caucus, to join the show here this week. I wanted Mark to give his insights on how Michigan Democrats are trying to better connect with rural voters and how we can create some more dirt road Democrats. Now, I did record this interview a day before the breaking news out of Delta County, so you won't hear us talk about it. But the Democratic Rural Caucus did play a key role in helping to oust Ottawa Impact Commissioner Lucy Ebel, and it's doing so much more to help reach out to other areas of the state as well. Mark Ludwig joins me here in just a moment. You're listening to LOL. It's the Left of Lansing podcast. If you truly want to get Pat fired up, talk about Tigers baseball or how you think the 90s produced the worst music of any decade. You've been warned. Email him at leftoflansing at gmail.com and follow him on Twitter at Left of Lansing. Here's Pat. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast because in addition to the weekly show that's released every Thursday, I've got the Monday musings and the Friday short. It's just really me voicing some more opinions that maybe I didn't have time to include on the weekly show, or maybe it's something completely different that I believe deserves just a little bit more attention. So again, subscribe to the podcast and if you don't mind, give it a decent review if you can. Well, I have been focusing a bit here on the rural vote in Michigan the past few weeks as I've talked with the now newly elected Delta County Commissioner Kelly Van Ginhoven and also with progressive organizer Joe Spaulding from Ottawa County, which also celebrated a successful recall of a right wing commissioner there. And, you know, it's something I've been wanting to focus on here on the podcast because for quite some time now, Republicans have succeeded in garnering the rural vote, not just in Michigan, but throughout the country. And that's continued with the Associated Press reporting this week that in early voting states in the presidential primaries, between 58 percent and 66 percent of voters from small towns or rural areas supported Trump, according to the data. He was less popular among suburban and urban voters. But as we've seen here this past week, Democrats are beginning to make some strides in different red areas of the state, and especially in local elections, which is giving many hope that if we just engage with rural voters and let them know that they're being heard, and even more, to let them know that there is 
some leaders out there who just want to restore some sanity in their government, then progressives and Democrats alike will start to make some serious inroads with these voters. Joining me now to talk more about this in some detail is Mark Ludwig. He is the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party Rural Caucus. Mark, thanks so much for being on the show this week. I appreciate it. Pat, it's my great pleasure. So what is the Michigan Democratic Party Rural Caucus all about? We're all about losing less and winning more in rural America. And an important component of that is better policy for rural America and for rural Michigan in particular. How'd you get involved in this movement? Well, in 2017, we all gathered at Cobo Hall as Democrats for our convention, and several of us independently had the idea that we really needed a rural caucus. We'll just go into the weeds of the Democratic Party. There's these things called constituency caucuses, Black Caucus, Gay Caucus, Yemeni Caucus, this caucus, that caucus. There was no rural caucus. And so we formed that in 2017. And at the hunger for this was evident immediately we immediately you know like next convention we had 60 70 people in the room we had a bunch of dedicated people who were willing to do the homework and there's a lot of homework to set up a brand new constituency caucus fast forward a couple of cycles and we are i think arguably one of the most influential caucuses in the democratic party right now not because we have mountains and mountains of money to spend, but because we just have this tremendous enthusiasm out here. I, let's face it, if you are a Democrat in a place like Allegan County, where I live, or Ottawa County, or up in the UP, you really mean it. You know, you're, you're, you're not messing around. So these are some of the most dedicated, enthusiastic Democrats in the state. We really felt the need to gather together to form this caucus to get the attention of the Democratic Party and to just do a better job out here. Right, right. And to help let people know that they're not alone, because back in uh, 2005 through 2007, I worked for the Michigan Farm Radio Network. I was a reporter there. No longer around, unfortunately. But I can't tell you, and this was always off the record with some people that I would speak to, some farmers or even you know some in the agribusiness world or whatever. They would tell me sometimes off the record, uh, no, I, I vote Democratic, but I really just can't speak my mind a whole lot around here. And I always felt like there was this depressed feeling out there because it didn't seem like really anybody maybe from the Democrats. Again, this was back in you know the 2000s. Maybe the party wasn't doing a good enough job at reaching people out there. And that's exactly what you are doing now. I'll give you a little of my opinion, you know, kind of looking at that long view. I went to Iowa for Howard Dean trying to get him elected. And I was in a bar with the orange hat on watching all that burn down about 20 years ago now. Howard Dean, as far as I'm concerned, was the last prominent national leader who really understood the importance of building our base in rural America. These examples you give are exactly what happened. You know, there, nobody saw any signs. Nobody saw anybody on down ballot races. You know, Howard goes on, just to kind of complete the story here, Howard Dean goes on to be the party chair for, I believe, a couple of cycles, and he undertakes this 50-state strategy. And they pushed a bunch of money and expertise and thought into rural America, and then we elected everybody's favorite president, Obama. And I love the guy, too. He did a fine job. But Obama sweeps in, and this whole talk of the diversity is destiny, demographics are destiny. The browning of America is going to mean that Democrats are just going to come right along. Jump forward to our current moments, you know, because we didn't show up in rural America, because we pulled back from the 50 state strategy, we don't have that base out there. We don't have the farm team. We don't have the bench. We have a lot of people who got to weather a couple of really bad recessions now, one from financial corruption and one from the pandemic. And there really wasn't the recovery in rural America, particularly from the 2008 recession. A lot of little factories dried up and blew away and never came back. Yeah. You know, a lot of other economic engines in rural America went away. And then they had to watch President Obama be president for eight years. And Trump comes out to them and he's got a message. And he, his message is, you got screwed. And as he got emboldened, it became, you got screwed and they hate you and stack on all the usual conspiracy theories and blah, 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 that make our team even less appealing to certain demographics. So here we are, we've lost 30%, 40%, 50% of our voters, depending on the township and getting them back is not a one cycle, two cycle, three cycle proposition. It means you got to really start working on it. You got to have better policy and mostly you got to show up. 
I think about this moment we're having, you know, just to bring it into this cycle. You know, I play politics on the local level here in Allegan County. One of my real allies that chairs the county commission board, he's a Republican. I know the sheriff. I know the previous sheriff. I looked at what's happened in my county where we've got one of these constitutional sheriff candidates who the establishment Republicans are not taking seriously. And I had to kind of talk to some of these guys and say, look, this is a real problem. This guy could totally win in the primary because there's not going to be that much interest in this primary. I asked them, you got any names for me to get a Democratic candidate out there so we can push back against this right wing madness? And they're all like, oh, no, our guy's going to win. No big deal. And then on top of all this, after, you know, I'm tending the garden of local government, my sheriff goes out and stands tall for Trump in his brown uniform, which he doesn't wear very often. He's usually in a coat and tie with a bunch of other sheriffs talking about immigration, which they have no authority over. But that's their message that immigration is destroying America and we need Trump back to fix it. And, you know, Trump just torpedoed the immigration bill and he got some cops killed. So here we are. Here's our moment. Here's the rural caucus and here's the greater Democratic Party in the form of the DNC having a rural caucus in the form of the state party having Project 83, which is we'll talk about if you like kind of the institutional party starting to take out state seriously. But here's this wave coming at us of quiet authoritarianism called Trumpism that is co-opting the sheriff, a guy who I know to be a pretty good guy and, you know, getting a full throated endorsement from the Republican establishment in spite of the fact that this is just kind of nutty stuff. No, you brought up a great point, and that was an embarrassment when all those sheriffs were standing with Donald Trump, an embarrassment to the state of Michigan, actually. But I want to get back to something you just brought up, and that was Howard Dean's 50-state strategy. It really did work pretty well when he was head of the DNC. If I had one problem with Obama, and I actually I had a few problems with Obama, but If I had one main problem with Obama, it was that we kind of forgot that strategy during his years. And it's leading now to this question. How do you think staying here in Michigan, how do you think Governor Whitmer has done and her administration has done in trying to communicate with more rural counties throughout the state of Michigan? Uh, (laughs) Let me preface, Pat. Okay. As a as a member of the state central committee and a a committed Democrat, I think on balance, the governor's policy is right on for rural America. We're doing what we can for the immigrant labor pool that supports the farming in this country, realistically, for the infrastructure we need to get done. However, they had a big swing on renewable energy, which is important. And I totally support what they did, but they were not ready either not ready or they weren't successful at nailing down some of the interest groups they should have got. Honestly, on the renewable energy thing, they should have had Farm Bureau in their pocket on that one. This Farm Bureau is the Chamber of Commerce for rural America. And this renewable energy thing is going to be great for rural America. And somehow they didn't, either they, they didn't try hard enough or they missed it. I don't know. I'm not privy to inside the black box. I also look at the MEEP program reforms, which were proposed. The MEEP is the Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program. And I'll give you a little disclaimer. I chair the Allegan Conservation District Board of Directors. That's the holder of the MEEP grant for Allegan County, which is, I don't know, eighty ninety thousand dollars $90,000 of money that flows through that organization every year. So it's very important to us. The governor's budget took that away, put it in MDAR, the Michigan, the Ag and Rural Development Agency, cut the number of staff from, I don't know, about 40 down to 24 on the theory that if they just professionalize the MEEP staff and they pay them a little more money, this is going to solve our problems, particularly Western Lake Erie, which is basically a environmental crisis that's being caused by agricultural runoff, primarily nutrients coming out of cities secondarily. That did not go down with Farm Bureau. I'm a Farm Bureau member. If you don't know what Farm Bureau is, look it up. It's really important for rural (laughs) America. You should totally understand Farm Bureau if you're going to talk about rural stuff. But they're kind of an insurance company. They're kind of a giant lobbying firm for rural business and rural farming. They're typically, you know, seen as aligned with large farming. I don't think they would disagree with that. I think what they would say is they represent all farmers. And much like the UAW represents all auto workers and is not out there for Ford's best interests all the time, Farm Bureau is out there for the farmers and the rest of us are welcome to comment, but Farm Bureau is going to stand tall for farms. Well, and I'll I'll give you a, a third one where I really quibble with it. Nine days of early voting. Man, that sounds great, doesn't it? That sounds great, unless you're the clerk in Clyde Township. And now you got to somehow staff up for nine days of early voting or say, you know, go downtown and go vote at the clerk's office. And the clerk 
we'll staff up for that. And that kind of makes sense. But I really think if you had said for townships with under X population, you got to have three days of early voting, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, prior to election day. And that would have been more elegant, more doable, something people could have maybe more gotten behind. But now my Republican county clerk has something to clobber the Democratic establishment with by pointing out that what they've asked for for early voting is really neither a necessary, given the other many ways you can vote at this point, nor is it particularly doable. I mean, it's just it's not going to happen. And it kind of puts the clerks who are already doing a difficult job where there's just tons of political nonsense coming at them and the position to have to say, well, you got to go to town. Sorry, can't meet it. So are we doing better? Yes. Are we doing good enough? No, no, we're not. (laughs) And I would just say the Republican policies for rural America, they suck even more because the Republicans are never going to solve the immigration labor shortage problem that's plaguing our farmers and frankly, construction and a whole bunch of other industries. They're never going to solve that. They can't. They've backed themselves into a quarter. They are never going to give undocumented people driver's licenses, for example. And the Democrats are talking about that because, you know, if some guy who's an illegal immigrant hits you in his pickup truck because he's got to drive to work, better he has a driver's license than he does not. You know, this is not about facilitating illegal immigration. It's about facilitating the smooth flow of societal goods and services and all that. Right, so right. What, there's right, my well, three examples. OK, well, Mark, then let me just ask you Then I wasn't planning on going in this direction. But if you don't mind, since you brought up immigration, is there a divide in rural parts of the state when it comes to immigration? You know, from all your travels, are you hearing that there is a divide on immigration? Like you said, Republicans have nothing to offer. Really, they don't have anything to offer on a range of issues, but especially on immigration, all they want to talk about is a wall and making people be afraid of immigrants. Whereas, like you just mentioned as well, on the Democratic side, they are at least trying to offer some solutions, like giving driver's licenses to migrant workers. So There's got to be this divide, I would assume, within the rural community, maybe just with residents who live in rural communities compared to farmers who many of them do rely on migrant workers. What's your take on that? Is there a divide? There are people in rural America who do not rely on immigrant labor. Right. And I think those people are much more subject to being to being demagogued about it, just to be succinct. There are people who rely on immigrant labor, and that is a lot of people in agriculture. There are certainly other sectors which use a lot of immigrant labor, and there is ample statistical evidence that immigrants are a net benefit for the economy in so many ways. And frankly, a lot of them will move to some town where everybody is like, oh, that town's boring, that town's dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, not compared to like Afghanistan or, you know, wherever they're coming from or, you know, some place that's got problems elsewhere in the world. So immigrants are filling in as some of our native born people are moving out of rural America, both professionally and literally physically and filling in that niche. So I guess, Pat, the best thing to say is it's complicated. Yeah, because there's definitely some prejudice. And just looking at the right in general, there is just so much a spectacular amount of lying that goes on and distortions, frankly, narrow storytelling that isn't really helpful. Let's just put it that way. Right, because um, it is such a nuanced issue, but I feel like we're not getting anywhere close to that. Here, I'm going to get really meta and into the weeds. I feel like over time, we feel like we've got to simplify and dumb down and run away from issues that we do not need to simplify and dumb down and run away from. The two big examples are guns and abortion. When I first ran for state house in 2018, I mean, I massaged those issues like it was a spa and it was my job. I mean, I tried so hard to just square that circle. What a waste of freaking time. Okay. Mm -hmm. I should have just said I am pro-choice and moved on. And the last few election cycles have proven that pretty decisively across the board. I think the gun issue is getting to be the same way. People are really tired. Like the normies are getting really tired of the gun nuts being kooky kooky. You know, just every day it gets worse. And kind of looking forward as a political animal, it's all coming to a boil this cycle. There's all of this 
insane talk that is going to get pushed back on because I, I think everybody kind of sees that these people mean it. I mean, January 6th, if nothing else, proved to a lot of people that these people mean it and they're ready to go. And even though some of that got tamped down because so many people went to prison and stuff, that doesn't mean that the rhetoric in particular isn't going to get nutty. I mean, I call it gun cosplay. You know, these guys who want to go out and walk around with their guns, all that's going to be serious. So we got to accept that that's the field of play. And we got to go out there and, okay, you want to walk around with your gun? Great. I'll come up to you and talk about it. Let's talk about your gun and why you own it. That's the kind of thing we're going to have to do. We can't just go watch more Netflix. That's right. not going to solve the problem. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what we have to do. We have to stick by our convictions, explain our stances, explain our positions when it comes to abortion and gun rights. You know, especially maybe with the abortion issue. We tend to be doing pretty well on that one. It seems like even rural America is with us on that one. But state your positions and communicate with people. Maybe then there can be some dialogue and then some better things can happen in the future. And let me put a little caveat on there. If you're going to come out there and say, we should just ban all the guns, <laughs> you could stay home yeah, for right. a while and maybe not engage on that issue. Particularly if you're like, are you a sporting person? Are you a sportsman? Yeah. Go out there and talk to the gun nuts. You know, if you can walk up to someone who's holding a gun comfortably, do it. Do it. Confront this nonsense in the streets. If you can do it safely, if you can do it calmly. In 20, uh, was it? No, it must have been 2020. Yeah. In 2020, when I ran for drain commissioner, I went to this huge Trump rally at a truck parking lot in Hamilton. Hamilton's in the middle of a 90% Republican township. And I don't mean that as an exaggeration, like it's really 90%. We had the guy towing the banner with his helicopter through there and the giant semi trucks full of Trump signs. And it was just huge, fashy rally for Trump. And my neighbors were there and I got to say hi to people and I talked to all kinds of people and I walked around and passed out my cards as a Democratic candidate for drain commissioner. And it was OK. It was OK. Nobody tried to hurt me. And we think we can't go into these places. We think we can't reach out to our neighbors who are, are caught up in this nonsense. And some of them just need somebody to reach out and say, you know, it's OK to go vote for somebody else. Here's a great one, Pat. Go to church candidates. And I'm not kidding. Go to church. See how many churches you can make it to by the time election day comes. If you work at it, you can go to three services on a Sunday. No problem. Go to coffee hour. Talk to those people. 20% of the people in the hardest right evangelical churches in our country will vote Democratic if asked, which sounds surprising to people. Now, people who are unchurched evangelicals who don't go to church but think they're evangelicals and like it's all angry Jesus to them, they're a different kind of evangelical. And this is the kind of like granularity we got to start breaking things down into in our mind as we're reaching out to our neighbors. Because, you know, mostly it's going to be about getting out our people. But yeah, there's people out there we can flip. There's people out there we can move. And we've been seeing that happening already here, even with those local elections that I talked about at the very beginning. Mark, we just have a couple of moments left. So quickly, I was wondering if you could maybe just summarize what Project 83 is all about. Uh, Joe Spaulding brought it up last week as well from Ottawa County. So I would like you to kind of explain that in a little further detail, if you don't mind here briefly. Project 83 is the brainchild of LaVora Barnes and some of the other people at the Democratic Party. When we got smoked so hard in rural America in 2016, the state party, the institutional state party also noticed. So they create Project 83 and they hired a bunch of essentially regional organizers to be permanent employees. You know, Pat, there are still uh, a few counties where the Democratic Party has actually dried up and blown away in the state of Michigan. Project 83, the Rural Caucus, we're out here trying to stand those back up, both working with each other and working as more like the institutional party in the case of Project 83 and the grassroots, the volunteer base in the case of the Rural Caucus. We work hand in glove with each other. We're pretty stoked about the whole Democratic Party in general. So I don't want to break these up like they're entirely discrete entities. They aren't. But, you know, we're all kind of pulling in the same direction, just from slightly different starting points. Hmm. And before we conclude here, I want to also bring up that the Democratic Party Rural Caucus recently held a summit. Uh, can you tell the listeners out there what was covered at this summit and maybe what kinds of plans were you able to come up with here for this upcoming election? This was our second annual Rural Summit. This is an opportunity, first of all, just to network with each other. 
which is huge. Just being in a room with 230 other rural Democrats really allows people to make a lot of connections. And we also heard from just a lot of different fantastic speakers, people like Celinda Lake, who's a big pollster within the Democratic Party, really drilling down on where our winning and losing issues are, things like that. It's certainly a time for us to meet with our union representatives. We had a good presence of them. We heard from the One Campaign, and I guess one of the great things that's going on this year is the One Campaign is standing up in May instead of in August. The summit's really what we were hoping to be an annual time in election years, really talk aggressively about what we're going to do this cycle to win. Off years, we think we're going to be a little more heavy on policy Mm. and thinking about how are we going to deliver for rural Michigan. And of course, we'll mix a little of both those in all the years. It was really a great thing. We'd certainly use some support We're already fundraising and planning for our next rural summit. Would certainly encourage people to go to uh, mdpruralcaucus.com. Donation to the Rural Caucus will probably be more for the summit. A donation to my rural PAC, which is our effort to push money out to candidates. You can find that at miruralpac.com. You can certainly find us on Act Blue if you're an Act Blue person. I will say, you know, we did send some money to Ottawa County in this recent election. Honestly, we would like to send three times as much, four times as much. I don't think there's a better thing you can do right now. If you're just a harmless liberal out there and you don't want to get like deeply into the weeds of politics, if you can't think of who you want to give money to, give money to the Rural Caucus and we'll figure that out. Because if we could transfer a couple million dollars from Southeast Michigan to like every other corner of Northwest Michigan, that's high impact money. That's a dollar that's going to go a long way as opposed to, you know, sending yet another piece of mail in Macomb County. That's my pitch. Send us a whole bunch of money. And if you've got a really nice backyard, and a bunch of rich friends, reach out and say you want me to come down in my big white cowboy hat and talk about politics in rural Michigan. I would love to do that all summer long. And that's a pretty good pitch that you just put forward there. Oh, before I just let you go, you know, since you brought up how you helped out with what happened in Ottawa County last week, of course, I've talked about what's happened up in Delta County. I also hold the viewpoint that maybe winning these local elections in rural areas is really a good way just to start building a good foundation that can then branch out to winning state races and national races. I'll let you have the last 60 seconds. Go ahead. Pat, we have a huge opportunity in Ottawa County. We have a full slate of Democratic candidates. We already have two elected Democratic county commissioners in Ottawa County. You know, the thing about having a revolution is the counter-revolution sometimes bites you pretty hard, and I would love to send Ottawa Impact packing. You can bet my rural pack wants to send tons of money to races like that, And frankly, races all across the state, you know, having been a state house candidate a couple of times now, it is really hard to beat the weeds for money in a 4060 district. It sucks. It sucks to ask your friends to give you money for an election that you've got a really good chance of losing. So how do we overcome that? You find something like our PAC to pump money to those people. So they don't have to do that. So they can focus on winning in these hard to win districts, not on raising money from people who are not that keen on giving it to them anyway, because I hate to break it to all of you, but the state party does not shower money on you. The DNC does not shower money on you if you're in a losing district. That's not what they're there for to do. The rural PAC is here and the rural caucus is here to make up those gaps, to make up those places where the state party can't justify going. We're the ones who are going to make up that difference and your financial support, your calls, your help to us. That's what that's going to do. Mark Ludwig, chair of the Michigan Democratic Party Rural Caucus. Thanks for the hours and hours and hours of hard work that you're doing to engage rural Michigan everywhere and for just letting voters know that we are hearing them. And I'd love to have you back on again soon, if that's okay. Uh, You know, anytime, Pat. And I uh, stand on the shoulder of giants. I'm the show pony. There are so many workhorses behind the scenes here. You wouldn't believe it. It's Michigan's premier progressive podcast, Left of Lansing with Pat Johnston. If Pat's brand of progressive pontifications is getting you all riled up and you'd like to give him a piece of your mind, or if you'd like to tell him he's doing an outstanding job and to keep up the great work, just email him. That's leftoflansing at gmail.com. Do you have stories you think Pat must know about or guest ideas for future episodes? That's leftoflansing at gmail.com. Want to share your thoughts on how to grow Michigan's population or which flavor of Fago Pop is the best? It's Rock and Rye, by the way. 
Just email Pat, leftoflansing at gmail.com. Now, here's Pat. And that was a good talk there with Mark Ludwig of the Michigan Democratic Rural Caucus. I'll make sure to link to the caucus so you can join or donate, and you'll find that link on the episode page at leftoflansing.com or wherever you find your podcasts. Mark also provided me with some details about the renewable energy siting law that Michigan Democrats passed last year. It's helping really to even out the playing field on who can and cannot block farmers from taking part in large renewable energy projects. The new law still gives local governments a say when it comes to smaller energy projects, but in large projects, the Michigan Public Service Commission will now have a say. And that's why a group backed by the deep-pocketed land developers and fossil fuel industry types are cloaking themselves as part of this group calling itself Citizens for Local Control. Now, what they really want to do is block farmers from having any rights to do what they want with their land if they want to participate in wind and solar energy farms. We want to try to improve Michigan's job portfolio. And if we want to try to improve Michigan's environment, this is a perfect way to do it. But this group is trying to block it. Michigan Democrats passed that bill to help farmers. Right-wing Republicans are trying to block farmers of that right. And Mark brought up the Michigan Farm Bureau. You've heard me talk about them in some negative terms, especially when it comes to their opposition of this law. Now, he is right in saying that they are a huge lobbying group with many many opinions, and the Farm Bureau has always had different opinions within its group. And I saw that firsthand when I was a farm radio reporter some ooh, 20 years ago. Oh. And I have to tell you, they, they welcomed Democratic politicians to speak to their people, like when I was there and Senators Debbie Stabenow and the late Carl Levin spoke. So I'm not always going to say what Farm Bureau does is wrong, but I will call it out when I think it's on the wrong side, like it is with this citing law. Hey, you have to keep it real. Time now for a Left of Lansing last call. This is from the I'll Be Darn Department. A new survey reveals younger workers are prepared to move to states where abortion is legal. You don't say. <sighs> According to CNBC, the Youth and Money in the USA survey of 1,033 people between the ages of 18 and 34 found that almost two-thirds of respondents, 62%, would probably not or definitely not live in a state that banned abortion. And 45% of those surveyed said that if they were to be offered a job in a state where abortion is illegal, they would either definitely reject or probably reject the offer. Another 35% said they would probably accept the job, and only 20% of respondents said they would definitely take the job. You see, this is one of the many, many reasons why Michiganders cemented abortion rights in our state's constitution, and it's why Michigan Democrats have been busy eliminating so many of the years and years of Republican obstruction laws when it came to abortion care in the state. Now, the story also says findings like these suggest that state abortion bans could have a profound effect on how and where the next generation of Americans will live, and by extension, on the companies that will hire them. Which is why I have to say, if you're a business that wants the best and the brightest, and if you want a state where people will flock to, you best be thinking about abortion rights and women's health and of your economic future. You know, it's so strange. It's really strange to think that people will refuse to live in a state if the state wants to treat their bodies like, you know, it's the state's property. I'll be darned. It's also so strange to think that people will refuse to live in a state which not only forces them to give birth, sometimes at the risk of the mother's health, but also then refuses to provide them with an adequate safety net for the babies that they were forced to have. It's almost like the Republicans are full of it when they claim to be all about family values, but even more importantly, small government. I'll be darned. You're listening to the Left of Lansing podcast. The music you're hearing is by Wander Beats. To hear the latest project, check out Space Leopard on your favorite streaming site. Now back to our favorite progressive voice in Michigan. It's Pat Johnston.
That's going to do it for this edition of the Left of Lansing. Special thanks again to Mark Ludwig of the Michigan Democratic Party Rural Caucus. I appreciated Mark's candor and spirit when it came to what Democrats are doing and, you know, what they could do better when it comes to rural Michigan voters. And I also really liked his candor when he talked about how Michigan Republicans are not about offering solutions. Remember, you can email me, leftoflansing at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, the Gram, and Threads. Left of Lansing is also available on YouTube, so subscribe there as well since I'll be providing things on there you can't get just on the podcast, all right? And of course, visit leftoflansing.com. Rich, thanks so much for getting Left of Lansing off the ground. Time for an Oberon break. I think I deserve it. Until next time, take the battle to them. Thank you, Michigan. <laughs> The Left of Lansing podcast was produced by Pat Johnston, written by Pat Johnston, researched by Pat Johnston, edited by Pat Johnston, and hosted by, yes, Pat Johnston. Technical assistance by Dr. Heather. And thanks to our good friend Kirsten for the awesome podcast logo. Remember to visit leftoflansing.com for more news and information. Thanks again for listening to the Left of Lansing podcast.